today we're going to talk a little bit about sports nutrition for young athletes. And when we move into this presentation, this is the general overview of sports nutrition for young athletes. Uh, in a future series, we'll get into talking a bit more about endurance youth athletes and then also strength youth athletes as well. So a bit of an overview. We're going to look at our fluid and hydration. We're also going to look at our energy and our macronutrients. And then lastly, we'll take a bit of a dive into our micronutrients as well. So getting right into things here, when we talk about fluids and hydration, when it's dealing with younger athletes, we really want to pay very close attention to heat stress. And heat stress in children and especially young adolescents is a bit different than what we would see sometimes in adults. And so when we look at the greater effect that we have on younger athletes when they're involved in hot human environments especially, they're just not able to do a couple of things as well as what adults do. And number one is sweating. And what we're going to find here as we move through is that sweating accounts for about 90% of an individual's ability to cool itself. And so when we look at that heat stress and we look at the young athlete not being able to have the same type of sweat response as an adult does, we can see that very quickly that can put them in a compromised situation and we wouldn't want to get to that point with them. One of the main reasons why we also have a decreased effect in terms of the ability for a child or a young adolescent, again, to cool themselves is that Children have a greater ratio of surface area to body mass, and they absorb that environmental heat a bit more than what we see, again, with our adults. So that sweating capacity is key. Also looking at that body surface area being a dramatic impact as well. And then also looking at the impact that we have just in terms of the sweat response. And so what we see is about a 1% decrease in body weight will result in a significant decrease in the ability for someone to perform well. And so we want to keep an eye on that as well. And we'll get into that a bit more in terms of the effects of that as we move, move uh, through this. So a bit more on our fluids and hydration. Again, looking at this graphic, we can see that our water gain at rest, we're looking at a couple of factors. We're looking at our fluid intake, of course, and that's controllable. So how much an individual drinks and how much um, a young athlete will drink is really going to have a huge impact in terms of maybe future exercise performance later on that day. So looking at that water gain early on in the day, especially if there's a competition or practice coming up, is, is really key. Food intake, that accounts for about 30%, and it really depends upon the type of food. Uh, some foods carry more water than other foods, but certainly right around that 30%. And then the, the rest of that 10% is just for the metabolic water production that occurs. Uh, through the um, Krebs cycle, we produce water each and every time we um, produce the AT ATP through the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, and that's part of that process as well. Our water loss at rest, again, we're still talking about at rest. A majority of it, we're looking at urine excretion with that. But the other 30% is from insensible water loss or respiration. And so that could be the things where you don't even know that you're sweating, but you're actually sweating. Respiration is the key with that. Every time we breathe, you know that when we're in a colder environment and we breathe out, we can kind of see your breath. That's a good example of us uh, having that type of water loss through respiration, and it's happening consistently. And especially in a drier environment, when the environment's not as humid, we do see even more water loss at rest like that. Sweat loss, again, at rest is pretty minimal, about 5%. Fecal loss would make up the remaining 100% of that. Moving into that water loss during exercise, and especially when we talk about these young athletes again, if they have a reduction in their, in their sweat ability and their sweating ability, then we're going to have a dramatic impact on them um, not being able to rid their body of that excess heat. So 90% again of our body's ability to cool itself comes from evaporative heat loss, and that evaporative heat loss is through that sweat response. 
we are going to see, as I've mentioned previously, we are going to see some significant performance decrements with dehydration as the duration and the extent of the dehydration continues. So what I mean by this is that if we have a hydrated person, as you see on this graph, and we have an individual who's dehydrated, on our x-axis we're looking at distance, and then on the y-axis we're looking at the actual velocity of how quickly they're running. We do know, in general, when we talk about our carbohydrates, that children, and you read this in the literature all the time, or maybe you've heard of it before, but children oftentimes lack the full development of their glycolytic capacity. Um, so as a result of that, fat may play a much more prominent role as a macronutrient because children or young athletes can't utilize the carbohydrates. So during adolescent period, the difference between childhood and adult muscle enzyme capacity for that glycogenolysis may disappear at around that 13 to 15 age range. It'll be a little bit earlier in females, a little bit later in males, um, based upon the maturation process, but in general we see that. Now, I'll kind of venture into a little bit of training here as we're talking about carbohydrate as our, or as our macronutrient, but keep in mind, as kids are before that, at those adolescent years, focusing on some of the endurance uh, components related to their training is key to kind of develop those. Um, especially since we know that the glycolytic capacity may be compromised just a little bit, or, or I should say not as fully developed as what it will be as they move into the mid-adolescent years especially. So take advantage of those opportunities for those young athletes to really get a firm aerobic base early on and then venture into some of those other areas that are really going to result in m utilizing more of the glycolytic pathways. Um, so in general, if we kind of had to give a, a range of what we're looking at in terms of carbohydrate intake for our young athletes, around 50% of the diet should come from healthy carbohydrate sources. So what I mean by healthy carbohydrate sources is not a whole lot of sugar or simplified carbohydrates. More of those complex carbohydrates is what we want them to focus on. Uh, whole grains, uh, wheat, uh, bread, brown rice, I mean those types of things that are going to be definitely less content in, sure, in terms of um, glucose and the simplified sugars. Uh, in, so with that, when we look at the endurance athletes, we'll probably be looking at a bit higher of a percentage of carbohydrates in their diet just based upon need because they're exercising more than 90 minutes per day oftentimes, and sometimes, especially for those uh, adolescents, for those young athletes, we may be seeing them start to engage, especially in endurance sports, into two times a day practices and making sure that we do have regeneration of those carbohydrate stores in the muscle will be key. So when we look at our ability to take that carbohydrate that we're taking in and store it in our muscles so that we can utilize it later on, that is through a process called glycogen, um, through an enzyme that's called glycogen synthase. That enzyme glycogen synthase is at, is at its highest level right after we get done exercising. And that's a key component to this. So in this graph, we can see that on that x-axis, it says race. And so days after marathon, but we have that race where, you're, where an individual, let's say, is doing that type of length of activity, three hours or so worth of activity. We can see that we're going to use a lot of the muscle glycogen, which is the stored form of carbohydrate in the muscle, during that actual race. Our key is we want to replenish those used stores as soon as we can because that enzyme glycogen synthase, which takes that carbohydrate that we're eating and then incorporates it into the muscle so that we'll have it for later on. So timing is key in terms of taking in the carbohydrate sources immediately after exercise. And that's the primary purpose of showing you this, this graph right here. So just looking at the differences between our high carbohydrate diet, normal carbohydrate diet, or just a normal diet in general, and then one that would be lower in carbohydrate, we can see here that our time to exhaustion gets much better 
as long as we take in enough dietary carbohydrate. And so with our young athletes, we wanna make sure that again, at least 50% of their diet coming from carbohydrates so that they can sustain that type of activity for a longer period of time. And so we can see the differences on our x-axis, that's just our, our storage of that carbohydrate in the muscle. And then our y-axis, again, that's just our time to exhaustion. And we can see those low carbohydrate diet folks that it, they tire out pretty quickly as compared to those who just take in a normal mixed diet. And that would be something of kind of thinking a little bit more of um, something around 40% carbohydrate, 30% protein, and 30% fat, that type of diet. We're looking at more of that normal diet. And then with the higher carbohydrate, again, being something 50% or above, we can see how that performance is going to be enhanced in terms of looking at that time to exhaustion. So let's say that an individual exercises every day. And so they're gonna go through that exercise each and every day, and that's what these little green boxes on the bottom of the graph represent, are those two hour training bouts every day. So think about it, practice two hours a day. And they both of these groups start off with the same amount of stored carbohydrate in the muscle, and that stored carbohydrate, again, is what we refer to as glycogen. We have a low carbohydrate group, and then we have a high carbohydrate group. In this one, it's identified very clearly that the low is around 40%, and the high is about 70%. We refer to this effect here as just a staircase effect, whereby you have an exercise bout, there's a reduction in terms of the amount of carbohydrate that's in the muscle because you're using that carbohydrate during that exercise bout. And then you have the group that takes in about 70% of their diet as carbohydrate, and you have the other group that's, like I said, only 40%. You can see day after day, how we're gonna have a consistent kind of rebound a little bit, but then drop down even more with the low carbohydrate group. Whereas the higher carbohydrate group in blue, we can see that they rebound back nicely each and every day because they're taking in an adequate amount of carbohydrate into their diet after they exercise each and every day. So think about a week's long training cycle for a youth athlete who doesn't take in adequate amounts of carbohydrate by the time they hit Thursday and Friday, they're out of gas. They just don't have enough left in them to have a really um, kind of productive practice or training session. And so we really need to think through this early on in the week, make sure that they're being fed properly in terms of the carbohydrate percentage in their diet early on because it's tough to make up after the fact. And that timing again is very key for these individuals. This next one really shows us the difference between ingesting carbohydrate immediately after exercise as compared to ingesting two hours after you're done with that exercise. Again, the key is that enzyme that I mentioned before called glycogen synthase. That glycogen synthase enzyme is at its highest or its peak level immediately post-exercise. So trying to make sure that you have food available that's rich in complex carbohydrates for those young athletes as soon as you can after practice or after, after competition will help them not have that negative staircase effect that I showed you on the previous graph. So we can see a huge difference on their ability to replenish those used carbohydrate stores in the muscle. And if you wait two hours, it's kind of too late. We're not going to see a difference between those two groups after that period of time. So we really want to make sure that we take in that adequate amount and take it in as soon as we can afterwards. So what's, what's the right timing in terms of how long after you get done exercise should you eat? About 20 to 40 minutes is what we're looking at in terms of that time frame. That would be optimal. It's hard to eat immediately after um, an individual gets done exercise, so 20 minutes is a reasonable time period, but definitely get that food in you and especially that carbohydrate in you within that 40 minute time frame so we can take advantage of gl that glycogen synthase enzyme being at its peak so that carbohydrate gets incorporated back into the muscle so that you have it for the next time that you exercise. So what if, what if an individual just wanted to take in a high sugar drink or something 
close to around the time that they were going to exercise, like maybe 45 minutes uh, before they exercised, and they were just going to drink some sugary drink, whatever it might be, or take in some sugary snack. Initially, what happens with our blood glucose levels, and this is really prevalent in young adults um, and especially youth athletes, because they're going to take what's available. And so they take in this sugary drink or this sugary snack about 30 to 45 minutes before, and we see this huge surge in terms of their blood sugar levels. And then what we see is this massive rebound effect. So what happens is they take it in, and we've all experienced this, right? You have a nice big lunch, and then about 30, 40 minutes later, you get really sleepy. Because what happened is you had this huge surge in your blood sugar levels, and then insulin gets released from the pancreas to then take that glucose, take that blood sugar, and put it in to the muscle to store it as our glycogen, as our stored form of carbohydrate. Well, the same thing is going to happen here, but now we have exercise that's happening as well. So we have insulin that gets released, and then when we exercise, we're going to take that and utilize that blood sugar that's there as well. So we get an amplified effect, and we become what we refer to as hypoglycemic. Low blood sugar happens as a result, which makes someone really sleepy. So how well do you think a youth athlete will perform if they have low blood sugar, which means that they're really sleepy and they'd rather be taking a nap or laying down than actually competing. And obviously we can appreciate that performance isn't gonna be that good. And it's really hard to rebound from that. As you can see on this graph, even though you kind of are starting to come out of the woods, I mean, it takes 75, close to 90 minutes to kind of get back to that baseline level of where we would want that resting blood glucose to be, which is around 80 milligrams per deciliter or so. So the key with that is to, if they are gonna take in a more simple carbohydrate when they're exercising, Gatorade, Powerade, those types of things, don't do it. 45 to 30 minutes out. Do it about five minutes before or more appropriately during exercise so that we don't get this huge insulin surge as a result of the increased um, glucose that we're taking into our body. So really time that out again, making sure that it's during and not before so that we don't see this type of peak and then a crash that occurs with this hypoglycemia. Lastly, with our macronutrients is our fat. And so we talked about protein, we talked about carbohydrate, and now we're into our fat. When we look at um, fat, there's really no recommended dietary allowances for fat or for adequate intake for our total fat. But we do have a few things that we can go by in terms of what's recommended. And one of those is just looking at adequate intake for the essential fats. And so I list these out here for you just so you can see the differences between genders and age ranges for boys 9 to 13, boys 14 to 18, and then girls 9 to 13 and, um, and 14 to 18 as well. So that is uh, key for us to kind of understand those differences um, in terms of what the adequate intake is of those. Again, as I mentioned a, a little while back, restricting some of these macronutrients in children can hinder them both short-term and long-term. Restricting fat intake in healthy, especially non-obese young athletes can really impair growth and development. And it really could be direct or indirect. It, it just depends on the total caloric restriction that they're undergoing, whether or not it's just fat or it's caloric restriction from all macronutrients. So total calories that they're taking in is not adequate. We really don't want to abstain from certain foods that contain high amounts of fat in young athletes. And some examples with that, of that would be dairy, uh, red meat, um, because these can really relate or lead to, I should say, to deficits in um, such things as calcium, magnesium, iron, zinc, chromium, B12, and a lot of our fat-soluble vitamins that we know are critical components to growth. So, so imagine uh, one of our young athletes going through a growth spurt, 
and we're withholding some of these essential nutrients, we can see that that might have a negative impact on them having the type of growth that they may have had if we didn't limit or restrict either this macronutrient being fat, the essential fats, or just total calories in general. Now, if we're talking about an individual who might be obese and they do need to have a reduction in total body fatness, that's a different conversation to have. But certainly, especially during those growth spurts, we even need to be careful with athletes that may be oh, even on the verge of being obese in terms of restricting these essential fats with them. So that's another thing to really keep an eye on. Our micronutrients, really when we talk about our micronutrients in general, if someone's not deficient or not having a reduction in those macronutrients that we'd already talked about, um, so if those macronutrients are sufficient in terms of meeting their needs, then we probably don't need to be too concerned about them being deficient in any of our micronutrients. Again, a balanced diet, making sure that we're not restricting anything in terms of the dairy, the red meat, those types of things in children are going to be key with that. Um, one thing that we do need to be concerned about in terms of our micronutrients would be the electrolytes, especially if they're regularly uh, exercising in hot human environments, as we've already discussed with the fluid and hydration portion of this, of this talk. That's the sweat concentrations may contain higher amounts of that electrolyte and therefore we would want to replace that. And again, there's many different uh, sports drinks that are out there that have those in them or electrolyte tabs that individuals can take as well if that's a concern based upon the type of activity that uh, the young athlete may be engaged with. So again, inadequate intake of energy, protein, and vitamin D that parallel the low calcium intake may negatively impact the bone health of the individual. And that's short and long-term. And sometimes the long-term uh, effects of that aren't actually seen for decades later. So it's tough to make that up afterwards. Once that bone health is compromised, um, when an individual would get into their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, you can't go back to when they were an adolescent and kind of make up ground with that. Low iron, especially in our adolescent females may cause poor performance as well because that's gonna decrease their, um, their capacity to carry oxygen through our red blood cells as well. And we know protein works to facilitate the absorption of iron. So looking at this macronutrient first, that being protein is gonna be paramount for us to ensure that they're not deficient in any of these micronutrients. So bottom line with that, don't withhold any of these macronutrients, especially don't think that withholding fat for um, developing adolescent athletes is going to benefit them. It's usually not, especially again, if they're not obese, it would not be advised. So what are some of our take homes with this? Well, number one, let's be aware of that heat stress. Let's be aware of the differences that's there between our young athletes compared to adults with that. Again, dealing with body surface area, dealing with the inability to have the same type of sweat response. Uh, and also understanding that just a 1% decrease in body weight in these young athletes can have a dramatic impact on their performance. Young athletes should consume around 20% protein. Again, we said one pound per um, pound of body weight. About uh, 50 plus percent should come from carbohydrate and then the rest should be from our healthy fats. Mono, unsaturated fats is what we're looking at with those, um, with those healthy fats. Post carbs, like we said, these are gonna be key to restoring the lost muscle glycogen, the lost stores of carbohydrate in the muscle and ensuring adequate stores for that next bout of exercise that they're gonna happen, that's gonna to happen tomorrow and the day after that. And then the key to long-term performance gains really in young athletes, what it all comes down to, regardless of sport activity, is that there has to be consistency and you have to make it fun for them. So if you prescribe this really rigid diet for a young athlete, the adherence to that is gonna be extremely poor. And uh, as we know with a lot of um, uh, teenagers, especially, they'll rebel against it anyways. Make it their idea make it fun for them to want to follow that and see the benefits of it. And then it can be a lifestyle change for them as well. And then of course we have a bunch of references uh, that, that are incorporated into a lot of what I talked about today. Uh, look forward to feedback from everyone on this. Thank you.